daughter and her husband were went to a wedding somewhere in a fancy place. So, anyway, they'll be back next week. Hallelujah. Okay, we're at Ecclesiastes 7, 8, and 9. And we're moving, I'm moving through this three chapters at a time. I think I'll finish 10, 11, 12 next week. So we'd be ready to start something else. Okay, we'll figure out what we're going to start next. This is a wisdom book. And what we're having to bear with him until he finds his wisdom. And he analyzes all the anxieties of mankind. Um, I had named this, Is Not This the Natural Man Today? As a question mark. In chapter 7, you'll remember, the quest for satisfaction and the preacher's understanding of the meaning of life changes again. <laughs> and so, uh, the preacher has pursued the material life up until this point, because he had everything. You know, Solomon had everything. And none of it brought him any satisfaction. Only to find that it was empty, worthless, monotonous, and vanity. Um, this morning when I was talking to David, he's going to the Gingles. They, are, they won't be here next week. Um, David's uh, youngest son is getting married in Colorado next week. So uh, it's going to be a great occasion. And his son just, his son was in the ministry. I think he said for 15 years, and then he decided to go back to uh, uh, State Patrol School, and he graduated and getting married. So it'll be a fun time in Colorado. But David said, but I, I can't wait to get back home. He hadn't left you. And I said, <laughs> and I, and of course, you've heard me say that there was a time in my life where I had a lot of wanderlust, where I was ready to go wherever, whenever. Uh, of course, Don definitely had wanderlust, but uh, so he was a traveler. And, uh, and even to foreign countries, but I don't have that in me so much anymore. I'm just glad to be at home. So last week I was with Shanna in Galveston. A lovely hotel and everything was very luxurious. I guess it's just as good as you could get. And I thought, well, I'd be glad to get home. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where our preacher is right now. He's had it all, okay? And he finds he has not found happiness in it. It's empty, worthless, monotonous, and vanity. And he's still looking for that place of peace and that place of, that God is bringing him to. So now he turns to the world of morals for satisfaction and answers. He traveled a path that moralists and philosophers still traverse today. And if you were like me when I was younger, I mean, I'm trying to find the answer to life and I, all of these answers. In brief, it is be good, get a good name, avoid the house of feasting, and consider the serious things of life. Get wisdom and avoid folly. Be a patriotic citizen, not be too good nor too sinful. Avoid excess. Strive a happy medium and use teaching of modern thought. Okay, he's exploring all of that now. I don't know if any of you ever did. Is this not the natural man today and the doctrine of the contemporary church? Which is where he's in what he's exploring. Do all things in moderation. Don't go too far. Well, as I pursued all these things, I suppose, in my younger life, I came to the conclusion that I wanted to go as far as I could go with God. Amen. 
And all that other stuff didn't mean anything to me. That's right. I just wanted to go wherever God would take me yes, um, in his life down here. And so I didn't take on that doctrine of do all things in moderation. I was going for the whole thing. <laughs> Let's squeak on chandeliers and, and fly into heaven. Okay? Amen. So this is not the revelation of God, that which I just read to you. This is the thoughts and considerations of man who is communing with his own heart, mind, will, and emotions. Communing with his soul. It's contrasted to the union and communion with the Lord in the realm of the Spirit. And as far as I'm concerned, there is nothing this world has that even compares to it. I'd rather swing in heaven with Jesus every day and be too far out as far as the world is concerned <laughs> than to have any of it. It's all nice to kind of pass through. But. So this man is thinking his own thoughts and he's coming up to his own conclusions. His verdict at the end of the chapter is that while God has made man upright, Many inventions of the human mind have altered the course of things. <laughs> God started out making everything just perfect, but man came in. God gave him freedom of thought. God gave him freedom of choice. God gave him a mind to create anything that's possible, and a man has messed things up. I'm actually, I think the conclusion is that he altered the course of things. The wise man takes account of death as well as life. His outline, look on life, is serious. He knows how to enjoy good times and learn from bad ones. Kohila, that's a preacher, observes that there are good men who die young and wicked men who grow old in their wickedness. <laughs> Which we all know that and people will challenge Christians with that. Uh, you know, that why had to, this, I could name a few maybe that I could propose to be taken out. You know, maybe the world would be a better place, but God hasn't done that. Uh, and then there are good people who have died young. You just have to figure God needs them in heaven. And that blows the religious theory that all trouble is due to sin. As far as I'm concerned, that's a religious doctrine. That all trouble is due to sin. In this world, we're going to have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer. God has overcome the world. So just because we're in the world and we're walking around in it, there is trials and tribulations in the world, and we are part of that world we're going to experience it. But God's going to take us through it. Amen. Um, Here the preacher brings everything to the test of wisdom. Chapter 7, verse 23. All of this I have proved by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? We know from Proverbs 8. That wisdom is the Lord's, and only through relationship with Him can it be found, or will we have it? The proverbial units of this section deal with aspects of life that anger or infuriate. He, he's dealing with his anger, and he's, he's furious because he can't control the whole world, I guess. This is that which frustrates. Frustration is the demonic spirit. Okay. If frustration comes on you, it is a demonic spirit. I once knew a woman who continually spoke over and over on herself of how frustrated she was. She just repeated over and over and over. I'm so frustrated. I'm so frustrated. She repeated over and over and over about whatever situation she was going through. 
She continually gave power to the spirit of frustration. Wow. Frustration is a demonic spirit. Mm. And so we don't want to give place to it. Amen. God's not in a spirit of frustration. This is a soul that is insecure, has unfulfilled needs and unresolved problems. They are not at peace with God or themselves. They're not at peace with their life. Frustration is an emotional response to circumstances where one is obstructed from arriving at a personal goal or agenda. The root is anger and disappointment. In psychology, passive aggressive behavior is a manifestation of the spirit. Biblically speaking, we often see this operate in the spirit of Jezebel. The manifestation can be temper tantrums out of frustration. Our high maintenance people, who everyone pampers to keep them from making scenes of violent behavior, our mm -hmm. embarrassing behavior, mm -hmm. are just manifesting and acting out. And people and families tend to pamper them so that if they can just keep them behaved, then they won't act out. Uh, if the family has a child that is troubled more than the other children, that whole family is taught by the parents to support and take care of the challenged or troubled child. True. So the whole family has one job, and that is to support and keep that child operating. Mm -hmm. And... In early Proverbs, the preacher deals with death or suffering. Now it is with anger and frustration. Verse 9. Be not hasty in your spirit to be angry. For anger rests in the bosom of fools. <laughs> this is wisdom to all people who are plagued with temper tantrums or uncontrolled rage. Anger, if it is not kept in check, can become a spirit of anger and it becomes a demonic spirit in us and becomes violent. Hmm. And then we move on to there are seven proverbs that are comparisons using the words better than. Start, start with verse one through three. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. We can, we can say, yeah, we're going to heaven, but as I'll get into this later on, he doesn't know about heaven yet. He doesn't know about eternal life. It is better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the confidence, the heart is made better. It is through sorrow that man learns compassion. Well, we know that sorrow is not better than laughter. But see, he is expressing his frustration at life. Verse 5. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Verse 8, <laughs> better is the end of the thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Verse 10, say not what is the cause that the former days were better than these, for you do not inquire wisely concerning this. This is a rebuke to every generation that considers the good old days of their generation. should repeat that. <laughs> this is a rebuke for all of us who remember quieter, simpler times. But this morning, I think uh, you're there at the DNC convention, and uh, they were pointing out the comparison of this convention as compared to 1968 and the similarities of it. I don't know if they've heard the prophecies that this convention is going to be as, what's a good word, volatile, chaotic, 
as the 1968 was. But Bill Hibbert was talking, and he said, in 1960, during that period of time, I think Linda B. Johnson was running, uh, without even knowing who his running mate was, Johnson, a fellow, but who uh, fell? Huh? Johnson wasn't running in 1968, he was running Liz. Johnson against, I mean, he dropped out. Johnson dropped out that year. He dropped out, and someone was running against Nixon. Nixon won. Who was running against Nixon? Who? Now, Kennedy had already been killed. Yeah. He had already been shot by this time, I think. But anyway, that's what he was pointing out. Coming into the 1968 election cycle, Kennedy had been shot. Uh, Mark Luther King had been shot. We were knee deep in the Vietnam War. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson had dropped out of the running because he, and he had we were no longer running for president. He was at, it was forced out, and Robert Kennedy had been shot, and that was the case of the 1968. And he said, as bad as things are, they're not that bad. <laughs> and he said there were riots and uh, protests about the Vietnam War. So we're going to, this coming week, going into the DNC. Hoover Humphrey? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, Hoover Humphrey. Hoover Humphrey was in 1968? Yeah. That's right. yeah. Okay. Who was running with him? Let's see. Who? structure. 
And so there's not going to be a lot that will deter from whatever is being planned. So it's going to take some prayer this week and some things that we really need to keep our eyes on. How did I get off on that? Because the scripture says, say not. What is the cause that former days were better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. So this is a rebuke to um, we have to believe that our culture has come more than this, but we still have a lot, a lot going on this coming week. And I want to say something else while we're on politics. I listened to Greta Van Susteren. Um, this, I guess it was uh, Saturday night, Friday, Friday night. And you know, she is very exact and accurate. I mean, you can trust her logic, her common sense. She's on Newsmax. And she said something. She was talking about her feelings for the Ukraine war mm -hmm. and how, you know, it, it's terrible that Russia has come in and attacked this, this nation and so on. But she said, and I know this is true, that we are pouring all of these billions of dollars into Ukraine to fight Russia. Russia is pouring billions of dollars into the government of Ukraine because they are paying them to, I guess there's a pipeline across there, to ship their gas and oil to Europe. Ecclesiastes, and that life is the life of God. 
Consider the work of God, for he who makes that straight, which, it, which he has made crooked. In the first half of this chapter 7, the theme of Ecclesiastes is followed up with a question. Will the life of faith survive hard and troublesome times when the good old days have gone and the days of adversity have come? The second half moves from the crookedness of life to that of mankind. In the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider. God also has set the one over against the other, to the end that man should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. <laughs> he admits his own vanity. There is a just man that perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongs life in his wickedness. Then the preacher moves into the reasonings of the natural man. Next week we get start moving into, well we do move into, where he come up with the faith of God. Y'all have, have plowed through this, but we need to plow through it. You know why we need to plow through it? And this is a Bible study on Sunday night where we plow through things. Is because this is the spirit that we're dealing with in the natural world. Yes. This is what we're up against. Yes. This kind of thinking and processing is, is on the generations that are coming up. And if we don't know how these spirits process these things, uh, then we don't know how to deal with them. Or the fact that the reality that they're there, because our mindset has already gone on to God. Amen. Okay, basic questions teaching the origin, universality, and inequity, and perverseness of evil are posed in a mixture of factual statement and exhortation, urging also the need for wisdom, which is so rare and remote. Man, as God made him, was all right, but his troubles are of his own making, verse 29. Love is only have I found, that God has made man upright, that they have sought out many inventions. I have to smile over this scripture. This takes away the excuse of Adam that the woman made me do it. And the excuse of many Christians that the devil made me do it. God made men simple. Man's complex problems are of his own devising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the problems we have in this nation are caused by men. And they, they devise those problems mm -hmm. of their own doing. Mm -hmm. So he concludes in chapter 8, verse 1, with a further appeal for wisdom. Who is the wise man and who makes the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. And this is seen prophetically by Daniel 12, 3. And they that are wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. This verse is a fitting conclusion to the Proverbs which have appealed for wisdom in relating to suffering and sin. The remainder of chapter 8 through 19 deals with the authority and justice in the life of faith. The preacher now faces the grim realities of kingly authority and the injustices of life and is perplexed with the enigma of life. As the thoughts fell over into chapter 9, he mentions the ultimate certainty of death and again turns to a position of faith as the only remedy. In this life, once you become a Christian, about any Ecclesiastes, and we haven't gotten there yet, or I have skipped over it yet, there's a scripture that says that we will be held accountable for every day of life that we did not enjoy. 
that we are to enjoy and bless God every day of our life and be grateful and thankful for every day of that life. That takes away all spirits of complaining as we get up in the morning and we thank God for the sunshine, we thank God for the blue sky, we thank God for the rain, we thank God for air, we thank God for breath, we thank God for life. And if we go into life with that approach, there won't be much room for, in the day for complaining. Amen. In chapter 9, the preacher continues his search for the meaning of life under the sun. Life has never been a respecter of persons. When we come into this world, we know that there's a time when we are going to die. Just like all other mankind. But we also know that we have eternity and that we're going to live eternally with Christ Jesus. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In this world you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This is the testimony of the overcomer through the life and death of Jesus Christ. At this point of the sermon, the preacher has not come to the realization that there is life after death. He has not yet received the revelation of the triumph of Jesus Christ over death. He's saying that death is the end of all. And we know from the new covenant that there is life which is beyond the grave. And that in that dimension of life, there is knowledge, there is reward, there is memory, and the injustice of this life will be rectified. I will say to you, Christian, because I have experienced it, that as we go through this life and as we follow Jesus in the good times and the bad, all of the injustices that come against us will be rectified in this life. All of them. You will see God turn it to your good. Yeah. Now it may take some patience and sometimes it may take years. But you but now that is that you did it right in his eyes when the trouble happened. As long as you stay true to God, you stay true to truth, you stay true to fairness, and you didn't manipulate or devise schemes or do some evil something to get back or revenge or all of these things. As long as you stay true to God in it, in this lifetime, you will see God uh, rectify. But it means that we have to do it God's way. I, can, I can't attest to that. But that is a fact, and I have seen it happen in my own life. I cannot say of any wrong that has not been that has been done against me that God has not rectified. Once I gave it to him and he turned it around. Okay. Because the same searcher could only see what was in this life and had no conception of a life to come. And seemed to him that the grave was the consummation and there was no future loss or gain, there was but one logical conclusion for the natural man. See, these, all three of these chapters is about the natural man. And it describes the natural man to death. The man who does not have the Spirit of God, the man who is not in relationship with the Spirit of God, the man who does not God know God. This was to have a good time while you can. And this is the only hope that atheist and unsaved person have. So these, in my lifetime, I'd say in the 70s, the psychologists begin to teach if it feels good, do it. Uh, you only really have one time. Just do whatever makes you happy. And the psychologists begin to teach that to people. And that is not a God. Amen. 
And that is the thought process of the natural man. And this is what he's dealing with in this chapter. If, you see, if it feels good, do it. And um, if that's what you want, it doesn't matter how much it, it affects someone else, just do whatever you want. This is how the natural man thinks. The spiritual man does not think that way. The spiritual man thinks, how does it affect God's kingdom? How does it affect what God says that he will do to bring me life? That what God will do to bring me blessing? That what God will do that the blessing is going to fall for generations and generations upon my children and my children's children? That if I obey God and I walk with him and I walk in the spirit with God, then through the generations of my family, that will continue to be a blessing. But if I walk after my own flesh and my own feelings uh, and I go into revenge and I go into hatefulness and I go into uh, trying to defend my own self in a way that's not of God, um, God's not going to do that for me. So the natural man is operating under, under that precept. If it feels good, do it. Hallelujah. Have a good time while you can. <laughs> Which is, okay, everybody should enjoy life. Yes, you should enjoy life. But you do enjoy life according to God's standards. Because in God's standards is joy and happiness forevermore. forevermore. And then it brings that same blessing to your children. Solomon's next reflection of life was its uncertainty. Man was not the controller of the affairs of life. He figured that one out. Control was obviously somewhere else. Life is made up of times and seasons. Life and death are out of the control of man. You know very well that death, your day of death, if you do know the Bible, you know that your day of death is already was determined on the day you were born. Mm -hmm. Okay? And whatever, however long we're going to be here on earth. That is, as long as we follow God. God has a, has a book written with our names in it in heaven. And everything that we've ever done on earth is written in that book. And, um, Hallelujah. Y'all heard me tell this story. I hear the good time to tell it again. My stories. It was a dream. There was an angel sitting at this computer in heaven. And, uh, and the computer was a huge, you know, bigger than this building kind of computer. One angel sitting there. And all of these little buttons on this computer had names on it. And there was a button there that said Carolyn Sism. <laughs> The angel hit the button while I'm watching. This was in a dream. And she came up and said, she's done all right. I'll take it. That was years ago, but I'll take it.
will be held accountable for every word that we speak. So, and as I said, my time between now and then is shorter than some of your time, and I want to get it right. Okay, I'm about to close here. We're going to close early today. Um, oh, I got to life and death are out of the control of man. One day death comes to all men, good and bad alike, with this one difference, that the good are in God's hands. Finally, one further evil is considered, the sin of ingratitude. A poor man in his wisdom overcomes a strong and powerful king and saves the city, yet no one remembers him. He says, wisdom is better than strength, and weapons of war. So I'm going to tell y'all one more little story. It was at Little White Church. We had a lady come into the church. She Her car broke down. She didn't have a car to drive it all. She was desperate for a car. And one of our members bought a new car and had a very nice car and gave her their car, but before they gave her that car, they bought new tires and put on it. They changed the oil, made sure that the car was in first class condition. It was a good car. She was just changing it because it was a few years. Sandra remembers this. She knows who it was. And what is this, 20 years ago? 20 years ago. Haven't forgotten the story. Okay. She gave her the car. And now this woman has a car. She didn't have one. And she came to me the next day at church. She says, I'm so disappointed. She said, I asked God for a baby blue Mercedes. And she says, I was believing God for a baby blue Mercedes. Ingratitude. Big time. Ingratitude. Now, if you want to believe God for a baby blue Mercedes, you go ahead. <laughs> I won't get in the way with that. But if God gives you something else, He wants your gratitude. And he doesn't want you complaining because the car uh, may not be what you were wanting. Amen. He wants a heart of gratitude Amen. from all of us. Is anyone watching us, Sonia? The yes. Kind of little stories? Yes. Who is watching us? Um, Diane Apple, uh, uh, Romy Mobley, and... Yeah. Let's see. Katie, Sandy Poole. Sandy Poole. Hi, Sandy. And Ann Payton. Hi, Ann. Are y'all listening to my stories? <laughs> Mostly I'm telling stories tonight as we come up on these scriptures because then they remind me of a story. Okay, 9, 16 through 18. Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard in quiet, more than the cry of him that rules among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. And that's the end of tonight. And next week, we will close it up and we'll get to the place where the preacher figures it all out. And he comes up and figures out what life's all about. Amen. But up to this point, he has shown us what the world system is like. And the people in the world system and what they're like. Which is what we're dealing with today. Questions? Anyone have a question?
spending that one in your right group of Ecclesiastes. For men who were so, for, for Carolyn Floyd, when she was 24 years old, trying to audit <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or 25 years old, or however old I was before I, the day I hit me. I would imagine I was 40. Before Ecclesiastes was like, oh, this is wonderful. This is a great and wonderful book. And and it was like a just a whole light of it came in, into, into light. So y'all gonna tell me what age y'all came into it? you stirred it up and it was um, after Mark passed away um, I was going to go get Ashley a car and um, when I was going to go get her a car I was trading in his car to go get her car well she had one in mind that she wanted and it was a bright blue electric blue car so I knew I was looking for an electric blue car well we, we found one it was really expensive and it was brand new. And I said, I don't think that one's going to happen. And so she said, that's okay, Mom. We'll find something else. So we went and found another blue car. It was a light blue. So she said, that'll work. I said, okay. So we got it. Well, then one day, years later, um, she got the car wreck. When she got the car wreck, we had to go find another car. Here we are looking for this electric blue car again. <laughs> and we found it. And she could get it. And what was so funny, she told me this. She said, Mom, do you realize it's the same year as the year that we went to buy my car? I went, no, I totally forgot about that. And she said, yeah. She said, God do. Oh. And I love that. Yeah. She knew. Anybody want to pray about the DNC convention? It's uh, weak. Ooh. You know, I'm just with God on it. Like, God, I'm just going to watch you. Amen. They're just going to put on a show. Circus. Yep. All about abortion. To glamour, glamorize abortion. According to the prophets, it's not going to be so glamorized. I know. It's going to be some more trouble than they counted for. Anyone talking to us on that Facebook? Um, yes, let's see. At one point, Diana said, sad, that must have been with the woman with the car. <laughs> And then Ann Payton said hello and yes, so she was agreeing with you. And then Dan Apple said, love your stories, your stories. And then she said, uh, sweet Sonia for Ash. Yeah. Her well, testimony. Diane, we missed you today, so God bless you for watching this morning and today, tonight. Okay, if you need prayer, let us be sure you get prayer for whatever you need prayer about. I think everybody in this room is prayed up. <laughs> You're all intercessors. We got Diana, okay. Tom, you okay? They're going to put this stuff on Wednesday on Robert Tommy. On these panels. Wednesday and Thursday, that's where I'm yeah. Wednesday and Thursday. Will that interfere with y'all's paint job? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Y'all right. gonna have to wait till they 
Do you want to say? Well, Friday is going on Friday. Friday. Okay. All righty. Well, I'm going to take wait to get our new piece put up, and I've got plans for it. <laughs> <laughs>